I've been working with process safety management and risk management program now for a little over 20 years. Um, Anna and I kind of started out when it was the old California RMPP. We had the extra P on, on the whole regulatory program. So she and I go back a ways, and apparently she is the reason that Jean and I are here today. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we get to embarrass you too. <laughs> so uh, we've been focusing a lot of our regulatory compliance issues with ammonia refrigeration facilities. And so our talk today is, is going to focus on what you might see in a process safety information document at an ammonia refrigeration facility. And part of that is because there's a lot of them out there. And the other part is that's kind of where our niche business is within the regulatory world. Tracer has been working with ammonia refrigeration facilities for a number of years now. In fact, both Gina and I are members of the <laughs> Refrigerating Engineers and Technicians Association. We also are chapter leaders here in Southern California, and we're always looking for regulators who want to come speak at our chapter meetings. So I'll do a little plug there. We hold chapter meetings once a month, and we have all the refrigeration technicians come out. We meet in Orange County and out in the Inland Empire as well. Just kind of, it's education for the refrigeration operators and they focus a lot of their attention on implementing process safety management and the CalArt program. So that's where our niche is. So we're going to talk today about what is process safety information and what are we really looking for. There's a lot that can be put into your process safety information document. Some facilities have compiled a, a large manual with everything in it. Some facilities have compiled lists of references as to where you can find the information. It varies from facility to facility, but what we'll go through is everything that you would need to find within the regulation. Process safety information is kind of the reference library uh, for the process under process safety management. Um, when I'm talking to people who need to implement this program, we kind of refer to the process safety information as your library, place where an operator can go to find out everything they need to know about their process. The, anything about the chemical, the pieces of equipment, how it was designed, how it works, everything that's needed to um, understand what they're working on. Another good thing about the process safety information is to use it as a training tool for new hires. So the more complete and the more accurate and the more detailed the process safety information is, it can be used as a great training tool, which in this industry is um, a lot of times on the job. So if you can refer to someone to their process safety information, you have a nice handy tool to use. So what are we gonna talk about? Basically, what is process safety information? It's very simple and straightforward, but yet there's a lot of detail. There's four primary components that a facility needs to look at when putting together their process safety information. And what we're gonna show you today is while there's these four simple components, each one escalates into a much larger amount of detail. The process safety information should be completed prior to or in conjunction with a process hazard analysis. So when you go to look at a facility and they have all their documentation, the process safety information, like I said earlier, is the library of information for operators and people using the system. Well, the process hazard analysis team needs to have that library of information in order to adequately conduct a process hazard analysis, which is determining operability and safety problems associated with the system. So without a process safety information, the library of data, the process hazard analysis could be somewhat incomplete or have a lot of questions. And what we find when we do new facilities is a lot of times in the first phase of the process hazard analysis, there's still a lot of questions because not all the data is there, um, particular operating pressures, or maybe a piece of equipment hasn't been installed yet, so everything's not completely there. So the team has to revisit the process hazard analysis when they do get all the data. So a lot of times the recommendations are things like, verify that the sensors will shut something something down at you know 250 parts per million, or verify that there is a light outside the door that will you know, buzz at 25 parts per million, because sometimes that logic isn't complete when you're building a new facility. 
So that's why some of those recommendations on new facility are the way they are. And they should be cleared up before you get into operating the system. Um, information pertaining to the hazards of the regulated material um, is required to be a part of your process safety information. In order to adequately assess the hazards, you need to know what the hazards of the chemical are. Information concerning the technology of the process and information pertaining to the equipment in the regulated process. And those are two key things that are required. Toxicity information is pretty straightforward. Uh, the regulation says you can include a material safety data sheet, soon to now be called um, a safety data sheet. So as long as they're in compliance with Cal OSHA regulations and have all the key information, including permissible exposure limits, uh, physical data, reactivity data, corrosivity data, uh, thermal and chemical stability information, as well as inadvertent mixing. Uh, there was a period probably three years ago when California changed, or maybe it was the feds. Anyway, the permissible <laughs> exposure level was different for, um, for Fed OSHA than from Cal OSHA. And there was a period that we went through where the material safety data sheets didn't have the California number on them. And uh, we actually, I experienced one of my clients got hit because they had a, a material safety data sheet that had the federal permissible exposure limit, not the California. All the California companies now have that on there, and that's something um, for that California suppliers have updated their material safety data sheets to have the accurate permissible exposure levels on there. Yeah, that was a surprise. <laughs> Another thing to, uh, that's changed um, with the respect to ammonia is how it's handled or how it's classified indoors versus outdoors. Um, basically, on, on your left, my right, um, the National Fire Protection Association <coughs> diamond, the NFPA placarding, used to be a 3101 in the flammability category because it was considered a non-flammable material, and it still is. The thing is, when it's handled in an ammonia refrigeration system, oil can migrate through the system through the compressors, and that changes the flammability levels of the ammonia. So what um, the Uniform Fire Code has changed the classification of ammonia stored inside an engine room to have a category of three on the, um, I have one of these, we should use it, three, um, for inside a compressor room. So sometimes, so you slowly you're gonna start to see two different diamonds at facilities. They might have this one outside on the fence or on the warehouse cold storage room, and then they would have this one on the engine room doors. So. And the process safety information document should be updated to reflect that as well, because it's, it's an important issue. And what they found is, like I said, with the oil entrained inside the ammonia, it's actually lowered the flammable, potential flammable level. So at this point, I'm going to have Gina Emmons go and talk about process technology and more criteria. Lots more criteria. Um, as far as the ammonia refrigeration technology, this list of information you need to make sure is located in the PSI and that you've, they've got supporting documentation for it. So the process flow diagram or a block flow diagram, process chemistry, maximum intended inventory, safe upper and lower limits, consequences of deviation. Each one of these they could have in various forms. Just know what you're looking at when you're opening up their binders or you're looking at their electronic documentation. There is one caveat where the original technical information no longer exists. Such information may be developed in conjunction with the PHA. So if it's, they don't have the original info, they can develop it, like Lee had said, mentioned earlier, just as long as they have it compiled prior to the PHA. This is a very, very, very simplified block flow diagram of a single stage system. This one I would probably guess maybe under 10,000 pounds. But um, I guess there's always that chance it could be over. But it's pretty simple. You just want to show the flow of ammonia, or they want to show the flow of ammonia. So starting with the high pressure receiver into some type of recirculator should have some pumps. We'll pump it out to some evaporators and make sure the lines show the content, whether or not it's liquor, liquid, vapor, suction, where it's going, hot gas. 
So it's pumped out to the evaporators, suctioned back to the recirculator, pulled off the circulator by the compressors. It's compressed, sent to the condensers. It's condensed, sent to the high pressure receiver again. Cycle loops over and over and over based on demand. A little bit more complicated. Two-stage system. Um, a little bit too much to go through right now. I can barely see it. But um, it's just got more compressors, more vessels. It has different stages. So there's probably freezers, coolers. Looks like those are silos. Um, it's cooling some type of liquid, orange juice, milk, whatever it is. And then um, the cycle's the same, just a little more complicated. Uh, process chemistry. Now, when you're looking for this, this is the information you need to look at. So there's general and specific, something that explains the general idea of a refrigeration system, that it cycles, it's a closed loop system, whether or not it's one stage or two stage or how many, however it's um, built. And then something a little more specific, where you want it to, to go in a little bit more detail. High pressure liquid is in the high pressure receiver. It is sent to a recirculator via a solenoid valve and it, um, at the recirculator there'd be pumps, float levels that control the pumps or shut off the compressors. Something a little more detailed. The um, number of evaporators, the kind of evaporators, the kinds of compressors, if they're screw or they're reciprocating, um, condensers, if there's a purger, you want to make sure it's all mentioned. I won't go through and read this, but this is a very detailed process description where it will go into all of the pressures, temperatures, safeties, and the flow and content of the ammonia as it goes through the system. Maximum intended inventory. This can come in all different uh, shape sizes. What I used to see is a lot of just a number. We have 12,000 pounds of ammonia, period, done, nothing. Now you're seeing a lot more uh, supporting documentation, probably because all the regulators are coming through and saying, prove it. Um, you want to look at charge records, if they have it, original fill documentation, if they have it. Uh, charge calculation, IAR has a standard they can use. They could use their um, contractor, they can do it in-house. Uh, the what we do see now are the, a fill log. When they do do a delivery of ammonia, they list how much was delivered. They um, should compare it to how much they think they lost, and hopefully there's some level of balance so they're not losing it, other than maintenance. And this is important because it shows up everywhere in the PSM and the RMP, the CALARP. Obviously, process safety information. They need to know this for the hazard assessment, the worst case release. The EPA RMP submit, this one's pretty important. And the risk management plan shows up everywhere. Ah, business plans too. <laughs> I think there's a talk on SIRS tomorrow. Um, we find that there's a lot of people that have a PSI, that have their maximum intended inventory, and it does not match what's in their business plan. Here's a sample charge calculation. The level in the vessels, evaporators, condensers, estimate for the piping, and then you get your total. Something that's evolved over the years, you know, when when process safety management first came out and people were struggling to put it together, there was areas that maybe just got talked over, a couple of sentences here and there, and as we've all evolved as you know, end users, consultants, and regulators, we look for more and more detail. And um, I've told lots of people, the process safety management programs we put together 10 years ago look different than the ones we're putting together today. And one of the things that I've seen change uh, throughout the country, not, and not just California, is what constitutes safe upper and lower limits and consequences of deviation. This to me was always, well, the consequences of deviation are in the PHA. Why do we need to rewrite them down? What are you talking about? And, and for a while, that was kind of acceptable. But we're moving, you know, as these programs evolve, they should get better. It's a living document. We should always be improving it. Um, the end users should always be improving it. Regulators are getting smarter, and they're improving their, you know, inspecting techniques. So everything's evolving. So over the last couple of years, we've started to kind of really evaluate what is safe upper, safe upper and lower limits, and these consequences of deviations. 
because it shows up not only in the process safety information, but also in the operating procedures. You need to talk about what are your consequences of deviation. So something that could be seen is something like this table where for ammonia systems, say we talk about what are the operating limits on the high side of my system. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, our optimal pressures between 140 and 150 PSI G. What would be the deviations and consequences? Well, low pressure may result in inefficient operation. You know, ultimate consequence might be we have no flow. Uh, ammonia refrigeration systems dependent on pressure differential to flow the ammonia around from place to place and then pressure to push it. So if our pressures are off, we, we could have no flow. Um, what's a step to avoid? Actually, this came out of a Rita meeting. So I'm going to keep pushing Rita, <laughs> Refrigerating Engineers and Technicians Association. We were chatting one day and we were talking about, at the meeting, about operating procedures and the steps to avoid or correct the deviation. And we just kind of started talking about, well, our daily engine room log is one way we avoid deviations. Uh, we complete an engine room log every day. Some places complete them every shift. And by going through an engine room log, you're going to catch a slight deviations to your optimal pressures or levels or any kinds of conditions. So that's um, one item that can be used in a refrigeration system to help you avoid deviations to normal safe upper and lower limits. Kind of run through, you know, f regarding high side of the system, we have an optimal pressure, we have a safe pressure range, we have minimum design pressure, 300. This is, this is the key. What's your, you know, what's the maximum, I'm sorry, I said minimum, maximum design pressure, um, 300 PSIG, what could happen, compressors shut down, facilities should have data on when their compressors would shut down, um, the oil separator relief valve actuates at 300, uh, continued overpressurization may result in operation of the pressure relief valves, the vent to atmosphere at this particular facility. Um, ultimate consequences exceed equipment design capacity and release ammonia. Well, what are they doing to prevent that? Um, they're testing their high side cutout annually. Uh, there's a system shutdown to reduce discharge pressure, so they have procedures in place. So this is kind of a table that you might see. It can also go and discuss low side of the system. And this is all in the, the PowerPoint that's on the online if you want to read through it in more detail. Because in some instances, we're able to point to, maybe I'm not on this one, but in some cases, the answer of steps to avoid might be operator troubleshooting plain as that because some, not everything is going to boil down to a simple one or two answer um, it's, and it's not always black and white. So there could be in this, in this column, operator needs to troubleshoot and that's where it's at and that's why facilities have a training program so their operators can learn to troubleshoot their system. Um, so this goes on to talk about the low side of the system, you know, suction pressure, discharge maximums and so on. We even have here, well, if it's below a certain level, we're going to you know, shut off a condenser fans as needed. If it's above, we're going to start additional fans. So kind of break it out as more, almost like a mini troubleshooting table for the entire system. This table gets into levels, uh, levels of each vessel, the high pressure receiver, the recirculators, uh, the thermal siphon and what could happen, what could be wrong. In some cases, it's really no issue. We're just monitoring system levels and um, there's no problem. In this case, we have a below and above what, what an operator might do to uh, correct the problem. Um, I talked a little bit about this engine room daily log. So this kind of comes up, like I said, in two places. We have to have steps to avoid under the process safety information and in your operating procedures. So this kind of jumps out of process safety information a little bit, but uh, one thing that operators do have as a tool is this daily engine room log where they could be looking at system, dis system discharge and suction pressures. They would be doing a visual walkthrough, listening for unusual noise or vibration. Um, anything that sounds different. That's one tool that the operator has at their disposal is they're in the room every day. Uh, it's almost like when you get in your car, you know how it drives. All of a sudden it feels like it's pulling to the right. Well, why is it pulling to the right? Well, that's when you take and you say to the mechanic, my car is pulling to the right and they can go and fix it. An operator has the same tool. Maybe the compressor doesn't sound quite right. It sounds a little different. 
than it did yesterday, and that's a tool that they would use, and it's jotted down on a daily log or in a log book. Um, several different things that could be on the daily log to check, you know, security levels in the vessels, any alarms on the computer system, purge counts, that's important for a freezer system or a system operating in vacuum because it'll help uh, tell if, if there's air getting into the system. Um, on a uh, transfer non-pump type system, a uh, dump system counts as important because it means that something's not balanced properly if there's too many. Evaporators and roof equipment, they should be checking those on some periodic basis, get up on that roof. I know we have some clients in the, uh, like in Minnesota, they can't check their evaporators because there's snow on the roof. So they have safety, they have exceptions to when they won't go on the roof. But here we're, we're pretty good with that here. Don't have to worry about it too much. Okay, Gina's gonna continue on with process equipment information. More lists. The PSI, the equipment specific information, a lot of it was the stuff prior was general refrigeration. This one is very specific to each piece of equipment. Uh, the materials of construction, piping and instrumentation diagrams, electrical classification, relief system design and design basis, ventilation system design, design codes and standards, material and energy balances, safety systems. Uh, the next two bullets, Lee will talk uh, a little bit later about, but uh, the owner operator shall document that equipment complies with recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. That's a mouthful and it's very difficult to prove, I find. So we'll get into ways that um, end users could prove this and have this. For existing equipment designed and constructed in accordance with code standards or practices that are no longer in use, the owner shall determine and document that the equipment is designed, maintained, inspected, and tested. Um, that's kind of self-explanatory. Materials of construction. You can find this in um, various ways. Uh, there are piping criteria produced by ANSI, welding specifications, shop drawings, some people have um, the original design stamped diagrams they could have. Uh, equipment criteria, uh, ANSI also has criteria for evaporators, condensers, tanks, compressors. Pressure vessels should have UNA forms. This has, I, I call it a birth certificate for the uh, vessel. And uh, it would have been produced when the, when the vessel was built and shipped. And uh, they should have one of these for every pressure. I, th I can't remember the size, is it like three by two, three and a half by something? Something like that, down about an oil pot size and larger. Manufacturer specifications, they should have, uh, especially if it's a relatively new plant, they should have binders and binders and binders full of uh, O&M manuals and spec sheets. I was just somewhere and we did an audit and I asked them for a um, information on a pump and they went back to their 1980, something set of books, handed me the pump manual and it was the wrong pump. They didn't update the uh, PSI. I can't believe they gave it to me. <laughs> I would have hit it. But um, the, you can find a lot of people now are storing it electronically. They'll have it on a CD. This is a good way. If, if they've got this, this is fantastic. UNA forms and the manufacturer uh, O&M manuals. Uh, piping and instrumentation diagrams. These come in all forms. I've seen them super old with no date or maybe a 19... 80 or earlier date, you don't know if it's correct. So make sure they have a current version of the piping diagrams. Most of the time, that refrigeration system has changed uh, since 1980. And I get a lot of, no, we've had no changes, none at all. But then again, that pump shows up and it's not on the diagram. Transfer vessels tend to show up too. They don't, aren't on diagrams, but they have them out in the system. Uh, make sure that the if they have their valves tagged out in the plant, that the tags are on labeled on the piping diagrams, and they're also noted in the piping di or not the piping diagrams, the operating procedures. Make sure they're in all three locations. If they're in one. They're in all three. Uh, it should contain uh, all equipment and equipment data if they've got it. A lot of the times you'll see if it's the you'll get the pressure sizes of the vessels, capacities of the compressors and the condensers. Electrical classification, okay, I'm just going to read this one because it's just information that they should have documented somewhere in their PSI. <coughs> National Electrical Code classifies ammonia among flammable gases and vapors of liquids having flash, 
splash point below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this would normally be designed as designated as class one group D location requiring explosion, explosion proof equipment. Um, the code does, however, allow the following exception. For atmospheres containing ammonia, the authority having jurisdiction, that's you guys, um, shall be permitted to classify the location to a less hazardous location or designation. I don't know if anyone in the room has ever done that. Probably not. More on electrical. Article 50 also references ANSI ASHRAE 15 as it relates to ammonia room ventilation. This requirement, along with calculations intended to confirm the adequacy of the existing, are addressed in more detail in Section 13. Um, more on Article 50. Rooms and areas are also listed and explained. Uh, fans used for ventilation of ammonia vapors must meet the requirements of Class 1, Div 1, Group D. Relief systems. They're required to have the relief system design and basis. This is one we see a lot. It's uh, approved by ANSI and it's a simple equation. What you want to see is that the pressure vessel, based on its size and the refrigerant, has a <coughs> specific capacity, pounds per minute of air. You want to see this in some type of spreadsheet, some proof that they've gone through this process and that their relief valves for each of the process uh, pressure vessels meet this capacity or larger. What I find is a lot of the relief valves are larger than necessary, but it doesn't matter as long as it meets it. Ventilation system. There's two, a normal or continuous fans, most, most of the time it's continuous, and emergency. So for normal, uh, ventilation fans in the engine room, 20 air changes per hour. Um, let's see, the temperature should be at about 104 um, in the Inland Empire. I see a lot of evaporators they put in the engine room to maintain this temperature if the continuous fan can't do it. Does not need um, to be continuous, which shall be actuated by temperature, uh, refrigerant detector based on whatever the sensor set point is, and manual controls. Now for the emergency ventilation. Uh, let's see, the ammonia detection, or the, the concentration can exceed a thousand parts per million, must have manual controls, turn it on and off, and then there's actual locations where these controls have to be located, immediately outside the principal exterior machinery room. A lot of this, this, um, the location, you don't, I don't tend to see it in the older stuff, I think it's a newer code, I don't know what year it went into code, but uh, it's hit or miss sometimes if this stuff is there and labeled. Provide an on auto override, um, provide an on off auto override for normal emergency ventilation at a secured remote location. Make sure that this shows up in their maintenance program, both the ventilation and the testing of the switches. We see that it happens usually annually, hopefully they can do that. Design codes and standards, this is a challenge also. Um, Asking someone to provide this is hard if they don't have them listed on the original blueprints. This is for an older system. Sometimes, which is fantastic, is if they get a letter from the design company, the contractor, stamped by PE saying it's designed to the current code standards and then they list it. That would be great. The UNA forms has got it. Um, and then if you've got any, if they've made any upgrades, make sure there's some statement on the upgrades. I was just doing an audit where they, it was pretty fantastic. It was, the plant was built in the 70s. They had a letter from the contractor. You know, um, I think the letter was dated 19, I want to say 99, probably around the due date of all this stuff. And it said it was built to the current codes. They listed it all. Then there was an expansion five years later. The same contractor wrote the same letter saying it was built to these codes of standards, both times stamped by PE. It was great that they had that. Um, sample codes. These are current codes if the system would be built. They could be built to um, mechanical codes, fire codes, international, uh, uniform, whatever it is. Usually what I see is that it's listed on the diagram saying this is what it should be lit, built to. Uh, a letter saying that it was built to that code would be over and above and beyond would be great. 
material and energy balances. Um, for material balance, it's kind of not applicable to a refrigeration system. Material balance is measuring the in and out of a system, and since it's closed loop system, closed loop system, it doesn't really apply. But for energy balance, you want to look at the compressor capability with heat, and then the rejection at the condensers. Um, there's a place out in San Bernardino where they didn't take this into account when they were adding process lines, and the head pressure went up, and they had a release. When they did the management of change, they didn't check. I think they checked not applicable, and they should have said yes and done this simple calculation to prove they probably needed to change the capacity of the condensers. Ammonia detection. All right, in the engine room, what you'll see are sensors set anywhere from 25 parts per million up to 10,000 parts per million to shut off the lower limit usually shuts off the liquid flow to the plant. The higher limit usually shuts off the electrical, all electricity in the engine room to prevent an explosion. You'll want to see audible and visual alarms outside the engine room door, inside the engine room, just alert people not to go in or to get out. And then out in the warehouses where there are people working, 25 parts per million, it's California PEL, anything above that, they shouldn't be working. So the lower limit should be that. Uh, half the ideal H at 150 should shut off liquid and hot gas flow to those zones. Some people just shut it off to the plant rather than zone it off to certain points. Huh. Back to Lee, rag again. <laughs> okay, we saved the best for last. Um, basically, the couple bullets that Gina showed earlier, the owner or operator shall document that all equipment complies with recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. This has now become an acronym. acronym. I don't know. Is everyone familiar with RAGAGAP yet? You are today. <laughs> so RAGAGAP is now a common word that we're seeing. I've seen it on OSHA citations. And it is now, we, uh, one of our facilities was audited by a corporate auditor and he referenced RAGAGAP and what we need to do. So this is here and it's here to stay. Um, again, as programs have evolved, this, these two um, documenting that the equipment complies with RAGAGAP as well as ensuring that existing equipment meets current design codes has been tough to document. There's several ways facilities are starting to document this. They're following IIAR guidelines and standards. Uh, International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration has a lot of bulletins, a lot of reference materials, and that's an industry standard that people can go to as a reference. Um, we see OSHA citing the IIAR bulletins. Uh, how many of you guys use that as a reference document when you go to ammonia plants? Do you use it in your citations or to help um, say this is what you guys should be doing because your industry says it's a good thing to do? So that's RegaGap is the IIAR bulletins and standards to use. Um, what we'll do, there's lots of other references in addition to IR, but IR is going to be the primary resource for ammonia plants to go to. Um, there's the mechanical fire and building codes, uh, standards such as um, ANSI and ASHRAE, uh, ANSI and ASHRAE 15 and the ANSI IR2 have a lot of good design standards. Some of the older facilities though, and this has been a challenge for us, um, a lot of older facilities can't physically comply with some of these things just because of the way they're built. So what some facilities we're seeing requests now to actually do a regagap analysis and why it's okay we're not in compliance with regagap. <laughs> um, so that, that's the next, I think, PHA revalidation issues that we're going to see in 2014. You know, this is a five-year cycle that we're on, and there's going to be a lot of PHAs revalidated between now and June of 2014, and we've already been getting requests. Like, okay, one of the bulletins says you have to have two means of exit to the outside atmosphere from the engine room. Well, there's older plants where the engine was built and then processing was built and processing was built and processing was built and there's no exit to the outside atmosphere. But yet, you know, if you wanted to get sticky, they're not in compliance with Regagap because they don't have exits to the outside atmosphere. 
So during the PHA, one of the things that we'll be discussing is exiting and egress and how come it's going to be okay. You know, what can we put in place to say while we don't meet REGAGEP, we are still an okay facility and we're still good and we still have a safe place to work and live near. So that's the challenge I think I see in the next couple of years with this, uh, with Regagap becoming uh, a, a word that we're using instead of saying all the words. And I see that it is tough. I have, we have lots of facilities that were built in a city in the 1950s when the stuff wasn't in, there's stuff in Regagap about the distance between compressors. And, you know, if the compressor was installed in 1950, and they didn't have these distance requirements, then you know, I don't know, you know, so we struggle with what do we tell the facility to do, but we want to document that they're, that they've looked at it and they've considered it and, you know, we've been in place since 1950 and it's been okay, so we're going to keep going. Um, so those are the struggles with Regagap that I see coming and that, you know, you guys probably see too, like how far do you take that stick, you know, like do you make them move a compressor five inches because it doesn't meet the criteria? Um, so, so that's that's the can of worms that's opening with Rega Gap. I know we've tried. OSHA has uh, one. Cal OSHA has uh, thirty something forty eight, where they referenced a nineteen eighty two building code. And I know they were trying to get it removed, but it's hard for OSHA to get stuff pulled out of their regulation. And just opening that can of worms was a little difficult because there were some things in the nineteen eighty two code that people can't maybe can't meet or you know we, we've tried to say well there's better ways now or you know they're going to do this instead um, but I do see trying to take a 1970s or so facility and applying current practices as a challenge but you know that that's where a lot of companies are looking in their PHA revalidation where they're going to assess some of these current codes and standards and see what they can do and they'll do what they can do and what they can't we'll, we'll just have to justify why it's acceptable to, you know, say we can't do that. Uh, manufacturer's recommendations, the bulletins, um, really what, what's important too is the facility keeps all the data. We talked about, or Gina mentioned, a U1A forms. I mean, that's Rega gap right there. It shows what the vessel was designed to, what kind of thickness, it has all the data you need. Um, manufacturer O&M manuals, construction diagrams, even uh, request for proposal specs. If uh, companies put out a request for proposal, maybe they, you know, they still have that in their archives, but they lost the original blueprints or something. They can at least go back to their request for proposal and say, well, this is what we demanded of the contractor. Um, with respect to IAR, the good references that are out there, Bulletin 109 is safety system inspections. Uh, that's a good bulletin. It has uh, forms for facilities to use. And what people used to do was say, well, we filled out our 109, so that's sort of compliance with Regagap. And there's a lot of good questions on the 109 forms that helps facilities do a little researching into shop drawings and their U1A forms and their board certificates to make sure that's all there. And um, the 109s, in the bulletin, the wording is that IAR says you, let me think, should complete these on, was it annual? Annual, annual basis. So should in OSHA world is suggestion, but uh, a lot of facilities are, it's a, it's a good way to document compliance. Um, bulletin 110 shows a lot of maintenance schedules. Um, question for you guys. Um, how many? You guys, anybody out there, as far as the five-year mechanical integrity inspections included in the Bulletin 110, anybody kind of familiar with those or enforcing those? Or how are you guys, is that something you're looking at as a shall versus a should? <laughs> Just taking a survey. <laughs> should. <laughs> should. So the Bulletin 110 in California is like a standard. Good. Okay. Yep, perfect. Okay, good. Bulletin 111, uh, for some of us that have older libraries from IR, Bulletin 111 included the ventilation design and maintenance criteria for your ventilation systems that Gina was talking about a few slides ago. 
there is a maintenance inspection criteria and a way to, they even have a little worksheet in there that a facility could fill out to show that it meets normal ventilation and emergency ventilation standards. Um, that's been moved to the newer version of the uh, ANSI addendum 2008 something something. Oh, two. The, two. IR2? ANSI IR2 bulletin. They've kind of discontinued 111 and moved that information into a different place, but it's, it's still there. Uh, bulletin 114 is all the criteria facility needs for labeling. And I have seen that one um, on EPA and OSHA citations. The ANSI ASHRAE Standard 15, uh, one key thing out of that is uh, that I reference a lot is ammonia relief discharge locations. Um, ANSI IR2 has ammonia set points, ammonia sensor set points and actions, as well as e-stop locations. I've seen facilities get hit with that. Um, we were working at one facility, this is not here in California, and they have an engine room on the second floor, and their e-stop was, so yeah, there's no exit to the outside air. <laughs> um, they have to go down steps to get out. So they have a hard time with Rega Gap. And they had their e-stop, they had an engine room with a control room with another door, and they had an e-stop in the control room, but not on the outside of the next door, and not on the outside, and they had an exit to the stairwell, so they kind of got dinged for only having it in the one spot, not both. Um, EPA also has an ammonia refrigeration system alert bulletin that they put out in 2000. Um, that, for years, is what I've been using as Regagap, because EPA region... Three, I believe it was, Maryland area, did an analysis of um, a bunch of RMPs they got from ammonia refrigeration plants. I think there was about 35 facilities, and they surveyed them and went out, and they actually came up with a really nice bulletin and had bullet points of things that they found made a safer facility. And um, for a long time, that was a good reference to use as some rega gap because it was an analysis done by EPA and pulled it together, um, but, and that's on their website to use. Any questions on anything we've talked about so far? Rega gap or comments? Things? I think, um, oh yeah, documenting the rega gap. That's another. We talked a little bit about the process hazard analysis and the revalidation. Um, you can document rega gap under the design codes and standards section of process safety information. The written mechanical integrity program, by doing the five-year independent mechanical integrity inspection, is almost a rega gap audit because usually the person you're coming in is going to look for corrosion, look for plates, and look for areas that aren't really up to snuff as a third or an independent inspection. So that can be documented there. Um, any questions? What we're going to do is, um, being that this was right after lunch, I don't know if anyone needs like a five minute break. Oh, you have a question. Sorry. Um, um, I have a lot of program level two facilities mm -hmm. in my jurisdiction. It's a third or level three, so many of the citations in your presentation apply. But within the level two, do you, when you're compiling safety information, which under CalArt level two, that's what it's called, mm -hmm. do you look at it with that? Yep, yep. The question is how would you look at the safety information required in program level two versus process safety information is required under program three? And they're pretty similar, um, but there are levels that you just, it gets toned down a bit um, as far as the level of detail. I believe program two doesn't specifically call out materials of construction, and I don't think they call out. Um, it doesn't call out safety systems, relief valves. It doesn't call these things out. Um, but most of our stuff has close to the same. Like, for example, specifically, it doesn't state uh, prepare a P and ID. No. Item. No, it doesn't. So what I've seen a lot are block flow diagrams and then schematics. Uh -huh. A little more detail on mm -hmm. equipment, but not really cut sheets with equipment instrumentation and controlling information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, pretty much. 
Yeah, that's the problem with the program. Yeah, the program two cuts out. It's it's kind of vague. So I think. It, And, and that I, I was thinking along the same lines as you, Anna. She said, if you use HAZOP, you have to have some type of piping and instrumentation diagram to do it properly. So you can kind of catch it on that end. We pull it in under the industry standards. Mm -hmm. So you're referencing the IAR's ammonia refrigeration management plan, the ARM? Because they, they say you should have piping diagrams. So that's another industry standard document. We actually try to promote that outside of California because people outside of California have the 10,000 pound threshold versus 500. And the, the IIR's ammonia refrigeration management plan arm has in it piping diagrams. They have a management of change program. And the safety information pretty much follows program level three. That's a good point. You could you could pull it in under that, just plain old industry standards. So what we thought we would do is, if you want to take a five minute break, um, or if not, we can just keep going. But what we wanted to do in the after the break is, we have a case study. We thought we would show you. Um, we we need you to group into fours, kind of bunch up. We have four <laughs> copies of a case study, and then we have four programs and an audit sheet. So first we'll do the case study, and we'll kind of do that together. Um, and, then, um, and then we have a PSI that we thought you could audit. You spend 20 minutes, fill out the audit, maybe one person from the group could f talk about their findings, or if people don't want to talk, we could summarize it for you. <laughs> we could go through the findings and see what you got. The PSI I just handed out, there's four of them out there, so just make sure you're huddled around one of them. It's an actual, I, I went into a facility, I want to say 2008, 2009, and it was the actual PSI that I audited. Um, it has, if you look at the date at the bottom right-hand corner, can anyone tell if they think it's current? No. All right. Now this, we're just going to walk through. You let me know if you see it, and if you don't. But this, this PSI is the one they're still using today. So you guys see the um, chemical hazards? I think it's in there. You want to flip? I think it's pretty extensive. They got that part down, right? There's a whole lot of pages on that. Are there, are there any NFPAs in there? It's blank. I found that funny. Block flow diagram? Do you guys see any, any reference to piping diagrams? Maximum intended inventory, do you guys see that? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much a lot of hazards. Let's see. Process chemistry, I think that might be in there. Go to page three, three dash one. Now, if they followed through with the instructions provided by their corporate company, they would have more info, but they really didn't have any of this on site. Um, let's see. Where's the next list? Materials of construction, see any of that? They do ask for, there was an insert, I believe, for IAR forms. So that's a positive, but it was blank. So not very helpful. Relief system design and design basis, any mention of that? Any mention of electrical classifications, ventilation? What do you guys do when you see this as your PSI? Do you just kind of chuckle and shut the book? <laughs> Let's see. 
I wouldn't even know where they be to begin with this one, design codes and standards. I thought I saw in here just a generic, it was built to code statement. Maybe not. Two three has it. Has some uh, references to API and okay. And Turn to page one dash two. This one's funny. <laughs> one dash two, section one point two, first sentence. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I believe they had over ten thousand pounds. I think this shouldn't even tell you where the place is, but it was in California. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously there's no material energy balance information in this. It's just amazing. This system, I can't, how old is this system? It's super old. RMPP, it had one. I think a lot of this came from the RMPP. They have a PSM. They've not, no one's ever told, I mean, seriously, this is the same one, same PSI they have today. Never got cited for it yet. Definitely, they don't have a detector, so there's no mention of that in here. I'm ragging up. <laughs> I wouldn't even know. They don't even come close to even, they don't even put the statement in. Like, just the statement, we do it. We satisfy it. Let's see. All right, so this is an old PSI that someone is still using today. And here is how, an example of how the um, implementation of PSM, CalARP RMP, has evolved. So, yes. Basically, that's an example of. A really, really, really bad one. Somebody prepared a document to meet requirements, put it on the shelf, and it didn't touch it for five years. Well, what it was was corporate. So part B, what we'll do is we're, uh, we'll give everyone will get an audit sheet. So maybe you can separate the binder out if you want or, um, and people work on different pages, um, however best, or, or have a team leader and pass the book around. But so we kind of put together something that you might see for a brand new facility in 2012, hopefully 2013, and uh, audit sheets that we use when we go out in the field to kind of make sure they're in compliance with process safety information. These are from OSHA, uh, the audit sheets. So we'll give you guys like, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes kind of go through and then we can kind of have maybe one person from each team do a review or one or two people, period. <laughs> okay. All right, does anyone want to volunteer to do like a couple of the answers? Like, does, does anyone want to volunteer to go through like, you know, one, two, three, and someone else can do four, five, and six, and on from there? Well, some of them are hard to do because they're on-site observations, but <laughs> you can pretend. Any volunteers? Well, our, as a group, collectively, um, first question, has written process safety information been compiled before conducting the PHA? Don't Thoughts? Don't know. Don't know? <laughs> don't know, because you don't have the PHA. So possibly there might be, should there be something maybe in the PSI that says, that kind of links them together or even says some kind of statement about versus looking at one and looking at the other. The cover sheet? Jay? <laughs> yeah. Executive summary that talks about linking the two. That's an idea. Good. Um, What's the next one? I, I flipped my pages. Okay. 
This was information pertaining to the hazards of the highly hazardous chemicals used. Yes. Toxicity information, found that, a good MSDS. Yes. What's the non-California site? <laughs> Did that on purpose. <laughs> Um, is information included concerning the technology of the process? And technology of the process includes a block flow diagram. Block flow diagram found in there. Process chemistry. Uh, maximum intended inventory. Uh, safe upper and lower limits. Evaluation of the consequences of deviations. Yeah, just uh, on this particular document, if you had time and you were really evaluating everything, some things to look for is like, does the equipment table and the piping diagrams use the same name, name all, no, uh, terminology. terminology, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, because in, in ammonia world, sometimes they call things a suction trap or an accumulator or a pump package or a recirculator and there's different lingo. So there could be discrepancies between what's on the PID, what's actually out in the facility uh, labeled on the vessel, and what's in maybe the equipment dis, uh, in the equipment listing. In this particular facility, there's a mistake on the piping diagrams for the compressors. They list one of the relief valves at 250 when actually they're set at 100. But that would be if you were you know there all day. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And you were there all day and you were kind of combing through things. And, um, but that is, that is something that is wrong in that book. Um, is information included pertaining to equipment of the process? This was another bullet item. Materials of construction. Um, one item on materials of construction uh, that's wrong in this binder too is this is also something if you were there all day we're missing a U1A form. Um, there's U1A forms for all the equipment but the transfer drum system, what do they call it? They call it transfer system vessel. Um, but these are little little things when you get something that looks you know it's all pretty it's got tabs and you gotta start looking for the meat. Um, that's some of the meat to look for. You know, do these things all line up? But yeah, there's a bunch of U1A forms in there. Are they all in there? Um, do they have all the oil separators, the oil pots? So, uh, piping diagrams, found those. Uh, electrical classification information, everyone found that. Relief system design, that one actually is really good. They had design for the discharge header too not just uh, the size of the particular uh, relief valves. They had information on the discharge header and how big it should be. I thought that was pretty cool because that's hard to find sometimes. Uh, the ventilation system design data, that's in there. Was this the facility that was? No. There was one facility, we went through the exercise and their ventilation system was undersized. So while we put it in there, they had to actually go through and make a recommendation to upgrade their ventilation system. Design codes and standards. I think there's a tab on that. <laughs> uh, material and energy balances for process built after May 26, 1992. And that's found in the OSHA regulation. I believe if you read the RMP, it says 1999. So, I mean, if they were around before 1999, then you got to default back to the OSHA criteria for having that material and energy balance. Um, this facility, this is what it was, it was the material or energy balance. They were close. Um, and actually, the difference is the way they run the system. I think we had to actually add an explanation in there. Um, they were really close on their energy balance. Safety systems. Ammonia detector information, interlocks. Um, that's one too, a lot of times when we go back and audit facilities, we'll have a whole listing of sensor set points that were supposed to be set up, uh, maybe at time of construction. So it gets put in their process safety information and you go back and audit and whoever was in charge of setting it up didn't follow the instructions and set it up different. So that's one that's kind of easy to look at that table and then say, show me their computer system and that this is the way it's really set up. 
Um, has the employer documented that the equipment complies with recognized, generally accepted good engineering practices? <laughs> this is one that has the letter. Yeah, the contractor provided all those nice handy dandy letters. So that makes it really easy. I've seen uh, some facilities hire in an engineer to go through some code compliance or um, put their PE on it, but I thought the letter was pretty, uh, pretty nice and handy to have. I was going to say section six, but they're now tabbed by numbers. <laughs> Equipment, it's just after the process flow diagram tab. Should be the next tab. No, it's under design codes, towards the back. Probably about the third or fourth tab from the back, design codes. Um, what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we were thinking about not having sections when we did those, but then yeah, each page has a section number in the heading. Uh huh. Yeah, and there's a table of contents. <laughs> Yes. The material for the inspector, the easier the interview. That is true. That's a good point that Don brought up is the easier it is and the more organized it is from an end user standpoint, the quicker they can have the regulator come and go. Well, he didn't say that exactly. <laughs> so from an end user standpoint, the more organized they can put their information, the better. Yeah. That's a factual statement. Yes. <laughs> Good, good, good. How are we doing on time? Um, let's see. I don't know if we can prove this one or not. Has the employer determined and documented that existing equipment designed and constructed in accordance with code standards or practices no longer in general use are designed, maintained, inspected, and operate in a safe manner? I think those letters kind of satisfy that component. Uh, yeah, yeah, that helps too. <laughs> Comment in the executive summary. Um, we'll just walk through a little bit the on-site conditions on what you might look for. Um, basically, what like I said, this comes out of OSHA. It's a kind of a three-part audit. Does the document contain regulatorily everything it needs to? Does the on-site either records or facility look like it's being kept the way the document says it is? And then interviews, you know, are the people that are out there in the field maintaining it, are they kind of, do they understand what's in this section? And I, I think it's a good way to go through an audit. Um, do observations of a representative sample of processed chemicals and equipment indicate that the information is complete? Well, that's where you could go out, take a couple piping diagrams and kind of spot check or take the equipment list and have a walk through, check things off, make sure it's all there. Um, the process safety, um, process complies with recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. These are kind of things you could pull from the IAR bulletins or from that EPA uh, the EPA bulletin that they put together. EPA, like I said, the bulletin that they wrote up is really nice. It kind of goes through practical things that they found, like spring-loaded drain valves on oil pots, set points for safety, um, for ammonia sensors, training type documentation, log books, and it kind of has a really nice list that you could use to do your own little mini evaluation. Um, and then as far as codes and standards, again, it should be in there. You can kind of walk around. Can you see the plate? Did they paint over it? Um, these are problems that we're finding. A lot of people have insulated over the plates when really there should be a way to either show it or get a picture of it or something so that it's out there. Is everything labeled nicely and properly with, you know, according to Bulletin 114, those big yellow uh, labels that they ever, the ammonia facilities have. And then you could do some interviews with the refrigeration technicians. Do they know where the MSDS sheets are? Do they know their operating limits? Have they seen the process safety information? Like, do they know where it is, um, how to find it? Um, were they part of the process hazard analysis? And did they have access to this information as a team member? And so those are some of the interview questions. And do they feel it's a safe place to work? Um, those kinds of things. 
So with that, any more questions or comments or concerns, issues? <laughs> Great. Thanks. Oh, there's always, yeah. <laughs> I do that too in our board meetings. <laughs> That would be Thursday's talk <laughs> that I'm doing with Don. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that, that's a whole other can of worms. Huh? Oh, sorry. The question was, I said about interviewing the operator. And so the question is, well, how do we know that the operator is even really qualified to operate the system? Like, even when we go to interview them about the system, what, how do we know? Well, maybe on how they answer your questions is one way to tell um, that, that they've gone through it. Maybe they have a RITA certificate that they took a test called CARO or CERO <laughs> um, that, that says how that they're qualified to be an operator. And then they go through the training documentation that the facility has. Hopefully they answer your questions really well and then you'll just have confidence that they are qualified. Yes, and as Anna is saying, basically the employer should have some type of certification saying this is my guy and I have the confidence in him to run the system and I'm determining, I'm deeming him qualified. And I'll repeat that Anna is looking for some type of certification preferably from the Refrigerating Engineers and Technicians Association. Uh, they do have an ANSI accredited certification program where there's a test and it's all controlled and um, it has, there's two levels in there that operators can take to be qualified. And again, that's a Thursday talk. <laughs> Anything else? Great, thanks.